Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. So today I'd like to continue my rant that I did last week on UBS's buyout of Credit Suisse. You have two groups of people. One has the right to complain, one doesn't. One are the Swiss taxpayer that are on the hook for potentially up to $13,000 for this entire thing if it goes poorly. They didn't vote for this. They didn't ask for this. They were never asked if they were okay with it. They have the right to be mad. Then you have AT1 bondholders. AT1 bonds are perpetual tier one contingent write down capital notes, AKA if the bank's assets fall close enough to their liabilities, you don't get paid back your bond. The bank gets to then take that bond and put it onto their books as an asset, AKA you don't get your money back. So their assets are higher, therefore increasing the health of the bank. As a result of that, you get interest because you're buying something that has a risk. As a result of making a voluntary choice to purchase something with risk, you get interest, but you could also not get your money back. This is how these bonds have worked. This group of people have no right to complain. They don't get to mix themselves in with the Swiss taxpayer that has a right to complain because they never asked to be on the hook, but they are trying as much as they can to garner sympathy with the greater financial press and general people in the hopes that maybe they'll get paid out, maybe they'll be able to get a bailout, or maybe somebody's gonna write into the law that UBS has to pay them or something, which is absolute nonsense because they deserve nothing. This is an article from Bloomberg. Fine print is never clear. Just ask the Credit Suisse bondholders. The prospectus language for the risky bonds being written down in Credit Suisse's rescue is imprecise. That provides ammunition for legal challenges. So one of the things that they're saying here, there's another condition that's harder to call decisively. This is that the public support has or imminently will have the effect of improving Credit Suisse's capital adequacy. The public support here, as it says in the article, was liquidity not a capital injection that boosted Credit Suisse's capital ratios. The capital ratio means, again, your assets to your liabilities. How much stuff does the bank own versus what does the bank owe you? When you log in at CapitalOne.com and it says you have $500 in your account, that's a liability to Capital One. They owe you that money. That's a liability. Capital One needs to have a certain amount of assets to make up for their liability because they don't keep your cash in the bank. They use it to loan out to other people or businesses. They use it to buy property, to provide loans, and so on and so forth. So they have assets and they have liabilities. If the assets fall close enough to the liabilities, the AT1 bonds do not have to be paid back. The money from the AT1 bonds go into the assets. The bank does better. That's the entire point of this. And this was written over four years ago by Matt Levine, who is an excellent financial writer who I suggest you read. He has a really entertaining writing style and I like his titles. He's a, he's a bit of a wise ass, but in a very professional way. Santander didn't pay its non-debt because people were complaining that Santander didn't pay something. But he points out that this is technically not debt. The way an AT1 works, they are perpetual. They never mature, so the company never has to pay them back. They have deferrable coupons. They pay interest, but if the company runs into trouble, it can skip interest payments, and most importantly, they are generally contingently convertible, called COCOs. If the company doesn't have enough other capital, the AT1s are automatically converted into common stock or just written down. Now, people here are saying that the shareholders should have been wiped out before the bondholders, but that completely misses the point. The entire point of an AT1 bond is if the assets drop close enough to the liabilities, but not below the liabilities, liabilities, close enough to the liabilities that the bond converts and that gets turned back into an asset. Shareholders, what shareholders have is equity. What shareholders have is the difference between the assets and the liabilities. That's shareholder equity. So if a company has $400 million in stuff, but they owe $300 million, that's $100 million in shareholder equity. That belongs to the shareholders. The shareholders don't get wiped out because even if Credit Suisse, even if they had $400 billion in assets and $399 billion in liabilities, while that is absolutely an unacceptable ratio for a bank to be operating on that thin margin, they technically have $1 billion of shareholder equity. When you read the comments that are being made in the news, these are people that, in my opinion, are fishing for a bailout, and they don't deserve one. They purchased something that has a higher rate of interest than a U.S. Treasury did at the time. As a result of having something with a higher rate of interest, you have to deal with more risk. And you have to understand, these people, I want to see if you notice something before I point it out. It says, in my eyes, this is against the law, said Patrick Kaufman, a fund manager at Aquila Asset Management who invests in additional tier 181 bank debt. A fund manager. This is not an individual stock purchaser on Robinhood. A fund manager. David Serra, founder and chief executive of Algebraeus Investments, said the move was a policy mistake by the Swiss authorities. They changed the law and they have basically stolen 16 billion in bonds, he said in a widely attended call on Monday morning. Founder of Algebraeus Investments. 
not a Robin Hood. Like, this is not some dude on Wall Street bets that decided to just buy shit based on a bunch of fucking emojis. This is not a degenerate on Wall Street bets that's deciding to buy zero day expiry calls based on a bunch of emojis that he saw. These are sophisticated investors, or at least they're supposed to be sophisticated investors, and they are failing. What Matt Levine said, four years ago, and what he said in an article recently is, you go to investors and say, would you like to buy a bond that goes to zero before the common stock does? And investors say, sure, I'd love to buy a bond that could never go to zero before the common stock does. And the bank benefits from the misunderstanding. Again, that's Matt Levine's very, very polite, kind and cordial way of calling all of these people morons. And it's why I genuinely appreciate his writing. The Credit Suisse AT1 bondholders deserve nothing. They deserve zero. They have no right to be batched in any way, shape, or form with any of the outrage that the Swiss taxpayer has about being on the hook for this deal. Many, many, many people have a right to be mad about what happened, not financial professionals that decided to buy something that has a higher rate of return as a result of having higher risk that QQs when they don't get the result that they want. These people deserve to get nothing, nothing from the government, nothing from the taxpayer, and nothing from UBS or Credit Suisse, because that is what they agreed to, that is what they signed. Sucks to be you, bro, if you didn't read the fine print. Do you think that any investment company that you gave money to is going to say, you know what, we're just going to ignore what's in the contract. We are just going to ignore the literal name of the security, perpetual tier one contingent write down capital note. If it was you giving them their money, no way in hell. So why should the rules be different for them? Screw these people. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Read what the fuck you're signing next time. There were complaints four years ago and something similar to this happened with Santander and people were just going on and on and on about Banco Popular potentially not paying back their debt. Oh my God, this is going to ruin the market for AT1s. No, it's not. It might mean that you guys actually have to do some effing research into the banks that you decide to purchase bonds from so that maybe just maybe, we don't get into this mess next time to begin with, because somebody will say a couple of years before this happens, before the Swiss taxpayer is on the hook for over $13,000 per person if things go south, hey, hey, you might want to check in this bank, their investments kind of suck, hey, this bank had shitty dealings with Sam Bankman Freed, hey, it doesn't seem like this bank knows what the F they're doing, you may want to do something about that, maybe, just maybe, if these fucks are actually on the hook like they're supposed to be when shit goes south, that they will have a greater incentive structure to figure out if a bank is worthy of purchasing bonds from, maybe, if they have shitty dealings with Sam Bankman Freed, Maybe if they have shitty dealings with somebody like Bill Wang, who is essentially a Wall Street bets meme lord in real life, people will say, you know what? Hmm, maybe I shouldn't buy that Wang's AT1 bonds. Maybe they'll actually report on this stuff so that not only financial professionals, but normal consumers will have a better understanding of where to bank with. Right now, people just buy bonds willy nilly. They just put their money willy nilly because they have no incentive structure to understand whether or not a bank actually has a good financial standing and a good reputation. And this should change. And again, having it change with normal, average, everyday consumers, I don't, I don't know if they're the people who should get wiped out first. Maybe it should be the AT1 bondholders who signed up for it. Your financial professionals start acting like it. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you on the next video. Bye now.